Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to this expert webinar brought to you by Get Abstract. My name is Kirsten Willa Dauberman, and I'm going to be your host for today's session. We hope that wherever you are joining us from in the world today, that you're having a good week. Um, we're very, very glad to have you here for this session. And we have got a fantastic conversation coming up for you with Dr. Gerhard Thiele. He's a former astronaut, spent 11 days in orbit, and we're going to be discussing what it's like to work in extreme conditions and what his experience is as an astronaut and during that time in space can really teach us about leadership, about how to create a culture where you can fail well, and also about perspective shifts maybe that we can implement in light of the current pandemic that we are all facing. Just a few housekeeping notes before we get started here with our conversation. Uh, if you have a question at any time, you can utilize the question feature on GoToWebinar and submit your question, and we will be collecting those to post to Dr. Tila at the end of our conversation. Also, if you registered for this webinar, you will receive a, rec a record of the webinar following um, so if you don't feel like you can stay for the entire time or you want to share this with a colleague or a friend, this recording will be available to you after the webinar is over. Um, also want to let all of you know that if you have not taken advantage of it, Get Abstract has generously offered its entire library of 22,000 books to people for free until May 18th. So that date is quickly approaching. So if you have not yet uh, registered for access to the library, please go ahead and do that for these last couple of days. Um, everyone on the team at Get Abstract just really wanted to make sure that resources were available to people so that they could make wise decisions in your personal and professional lives throughout this pandemic. And so those resources are um, still available for you until May 18th. So of course you can go to getabstract.com and take advantage of that incredible resource. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Dr. Tila, former astronaut, but joining us here on planet Earth right now. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Tila. Welcome to the show. Hello. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And first of all, where are you joining us from and how are you doing amidst the current crisis? Well, we, we live in Bonn, uh, in the former capital of uh, Germany, and uh, we're doing quite fine, giving all circumstances uh, considered. Uh, I very well understand that not everyone is as well off in this situation as we are. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so before we dive into you being an astronaut the entire mission, I do want to read a, a little blurb from the European Space Agency website that talks about your specific mission. So we can let people know exactly what you are up there doing and we can dive into the lessons. So. Atila, Dr. Tila participated from the 11th to the 22nd of February in 2000 as mission specialist in the STS-99 mission. The Shuttle Radar Topography Mission, or SRTM, was dedicated to the first three-dimensional digital mapping of the Earth's surface on a nearly global scale. He was responsible for SRTM operations, including the deployment and retraction of the 200-foot-high boom from Endeavour's cargo bay, upon which one of the flight's radar systems was mounted. Tila was also one of two spacewalking crew members in the event contingency spacewalk would have been required during flight. So pretty cool stuff. Um, Dr. Tila, many, many children around the world dream of becoming astronauts one day, but very few actually do. Was this always a dream of yours? And how did you get to um, participate in this mission? Well, I do not really recall it correctly when the, the dream started, uh, but uh, I, I do uh, I, I do remember a situation uh, in 1965, that was just 20 years after World War II, a completely different world than we have today. And my parents were able to afford the first TV set in our family, a very small gray box. And on this one, one of the very first shows I have seen was the launch of Gemini 3 with Gus Grissom and John Young. And I think that was the point uh, where I got interested. And I, my mother told me later on that uh, the 11 year old told her, that's what I'm gonna do when I am older. Now, uh, 
of course that did not lead directly towards uh, the professional choice in the end many other factors had to come together there uh, including luck uh, but uh, i think that is about when it started the the least i can say is as of that moment my parents told me it was very easy to find a christmas gift for me as long as it had to do with stars or space or rockets uh, it was an easy thing I love it. It's really uh, amazing. And we are so fortunate to have your perspective and wisdom here because there are so many lessons that you have learned and you've spoken very openly about those um, that we can apply to everyday life, particularly to leadership and to making our organizations thrive well and how to work well under these extreme conditions that we all find ourselves in. So in that vein, we want to focus this webinar on talking about four areas. One is preparing for extreme situations, dealing with isolation, which you know very much about, um, how to create trust and new perspectives. So first of all, preparation. Can you walk us through some of the preparations that you had to go to before you went into space? Well, if you if, if you go to space and it's almost it, it's obviously uh, independent of what the actual mission is about, it is not an endeavor that you undertake every day. And it requires obviously a lot of a lot of preparation, but not only by the astronauts, but by a huge team. In our case, we were 300 people, scientists, engineers, uh, technical technicians um who made it happen and it is amazing to see when people work together for one goal uh, what can be accomplished even if you think in the beginning wow uh, is that really something we can achieve we can if we uh, if we are dedicated if we as we say uh, hang in there and uh, and believe in what we are doing if we have a common goal a lot is actually possible but it requires obviously that you very carefully plan the individual steps that lead to uh, the ultimate goal in the end did you experience any setbacks during preparation or specifically as a person did you ever experience any self-doubt or questioning because you were a physicist you were a, a scientist and one of the things i've heard you talk about before is how so many astronauts are pilots first but you came from this different discipline did you ever have any questions or, or self-doubt how did you prepare for for this once in a lifetime experience well obviously we had setbacks um, because uh, without setbacks uh, you are not learning anything uh, you, you, you lay out things you you think this is the best approach and you do that in all honesty uh, but occasionally you will figure out that this approach did not work out the way it was supposed to or even blankly failed um, and then you need to regroup and understand what went wrong what can we learn from this how can we do things better so yet there are setbacks but Fortunately enough, not to the extent that we doubted the ultimate goal. Um, it, it was not a setback uh, that we had to um, say, well, th this is too demanding or we have not the resources available uh, to really uh, master this challenge. So setbacks belong when you do something out of this world. I almost had that. Uh, if you do something, <laughs> Uh, which is extraordinary setbacks are natural uh, and they must not derail you i think this webinar is going to be full of space puns because they're just way too easy so <laughs> for all of you who are watching you might have to to um, come along with us on that ride but um did you prepare specifically for any crisis situations because I can imagine, you know, when we make mistakes or we fail in our everyday work life, that is one thing. But when the stakes are so high, how do you prepare for a crisis or an emergency in space and orbit? Of course, you also prepare for crisis situations. Uh, there, there are some that are quite obvious that they can happen. You lose an engine on ascent and, and all kinds of technical failures that might be possible. And it is a key thing in preparation of such uh, a mission 
that you try to think about almost every possibility that can go wrong. However, experience taught us that other things will go wrong, those that you have not prepared for. Now, the conclusion is not, uh, well, we could have saved all the time in preparing for eventual mishaps, because in dealing with those, even if they did not happen, we learned things. We learned how to react in such a situation, and that gives you a tool in your toolbox to also react to things that you have not foreseen. So, um, yes, uh, we prepared for numerous things. And just to give you one number, uh, the ascent in a mission lasts eight and a half minutes. We practiced it for our flight 106 times. Wow. Not only once or twice or three times. Yeah, 106 times. And why yes. not 107? Well, um, at one point in time, uh, the, the question is, uh, is is a very valid one, and you can argue, would not 80 have been enough? Uh, now, the, the 106 is a little bit uh, bigger because our flight got delayed, and so when you uh, have a delay, you, you need to keep practicing. And that's why the number 106 is a little bit higher than it would have been the case had we launched at the, at the normal time. And it is always a, a question, where do you want to be? And uh, of course, we as a crew and our life depends on it. We want to be as good as you can get and you never can get enough. But resources are limited and our mission is in the end only the next one, but the ones after us are already waiting for simulator time, for time with the training team. And so we cannot ask for everything that we would like to have we need to be reasonable. Yeah, yeah, I love that. No, thank you for sharing. I, I think it, practice makes permanent, doesn't it? Doesn't always make perfect, but it definitely does make perfect. Uh, make permanent. Um, Very so well moving, yeah. So moving to the isolation piece, it's this weird conundrum because I think a lot of people's minds have been drawn to the experience of an astronaut or anyone who spent time in space during this pandemic because they think, well, goodness, if anyone has experience with feeling isolated from other humans. It's people who've been in space. But at the same time, there were six crew members aboard the Endeavor. So you may have been isolated from Earth, but you were stuck with the same five other people in very close quarters under conditions of high stress for a long period of time. What did you learn about how to be isolated well and then also how to manage being around the same crew members for that extended period of time in a small space? Well, well, the, the analogy of being in a small spaceship um, to the situation where we feel confined uh, today in many aspects uh, is, is obviously very close. However, there are some important differences. Uh, and the first one is, no one told me to go into the spaceship. I wanted to go in there. Uh, it's a completely different situation, as we all, of course, uh, know. And secondly, to every mission, there's a time tech. We know when it's over. And that makes it so much easier to deal with the situation. And that is why astronauts, strictly speaking, have it even easier, um, because these two preconditions are completely different. It's voluntarily, and there is a there's a date to it when the whole thing will end. Nevertheless, there are some things uh, that uh, at least I for myself have taken from that time. And what clearly helps if you are in such a situation, or at least it works for me, is you, if you have a very rigid schedule, you want to accomplish something. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the first things that I did for me uh, was to give myself a very rigid schedule, even if it would not strictly be necessary, but it helps. Um, at, le at least it, uh, it works uh, for me. And uh, if you are with the second part of your question, if you are with so many people on such a close, in such a close space, and uh, the volume of the shuttle, of the cockpit of the shuttle is not very big indeed. Uh, six people, 11 days, you 
you learn how to be very attentive and you learn how to read signs uh, very carefully from others. Now, the situation again is, um, is a little bit easier because you are not meeting at the entrance to the spaceship and say, ah, hi, uh, my, by the way, my name is Gerard. <laughs> we will spend the next 11 days together. We have trained together for one and a half years. So you know each other and you know what another person likes and you also know what he or she may not like so much and you just be careful. Yeah, and I heard you mention once before as well that personal hygiene, taking care of your body and your physical health in multiple ways is very important too. I mean, that is, uh, yeah, thanks, uh, thanks for bringing this up. Um, in, it, it's obvious that in a spaceship, personal hygiene is something very important. I mean, you, you don't want to be the one who offends others by not taking good care of yourself. But it is yeah. even more important for yourself, in my humble opinion, because uh, where does your soul want to live? Somewhere clean, <laughs> that's for it, sure. It, it, you, your soul wants to enjoy living in your body. So you better take yeah. good care of your body. Yeah. What seems to me to be so prevalent in your wisdom is that it's the simple daily common sense things that you bring into an extraordinary situation. Your routine, taking care of yourself, personal hygiene, reading body language, even if that person is floating in anti-gravity, <laughs> um, you know, that those very simple things can help make an extraordinary or extreme situation. Um, manageable. And and actually, that leads to a great question that we got from someone I would love to bring in here that asks, did your experiences in space help prepare you for the current crisis? You must be an expert at remote working. And you did work very remotely, obviously, with your team on the ground during the mission. That is definitely true. Um, and that is, as a matter of fact, uh, really an advantage uh, th that I have right now today where many things um, happen remotely still. Um, the, the amazing thing is you can do a lot uh, when you have an agreed um, interface, when you know that you can trust the other side. That is something which is, in our case, uh, so obvious that I forget to mention it sometimes. But mission control is where all the expertise uh, is sitting. And the astronauts in space cannot do anything without the support from the people on the ground. And that, of course, all goes remotely. But it has, again, to do not only with trust into the team and into others participating in the mission, but with your capability to listen extremely carefully. How is something being said? And I have been sitting on both sides. Uh, I've been sitting in the spaceship talking to the Crown. I have been sitting in mission control, being the Capcom, the person talking to the crew in space. And there it is even more important that you carefully listen. The, the very first step in communicating with each other is listening. Mm, that's so good. And that's actually a perfect segue to our next section about cultivating trust in a team and how to fail well. And I, I do want to talk about failure because you've got some great stories about mistakes that were made and how you all learned from that. Um, first of all, you, you talked about building trust with your team on the ground. Um, I loved, and I've, I've heard you say this before, that it's really important in the process of building trust to make sure that you communicate what you can't do. Why is that so important in the process of learning and building trust with the team? Well, the building trust is something uh, that takes time. That, that's why we call it building. The, the most important thing at least initially, is your attitude towards uh, the others involved. And um, key thing is, at least this is how I approach it, I, I always trust that the other person tries the very best and does exactly what she or he thinks is the best that needs to be done right now. And they do that to their best uh, abilities. But as I said before, there will be setbacks. Sometimes things will fail. 
uh, that ne not necessarily means that all of a sudden I don't trust a person anymore. Um, there is a hint that something is wrong. I have no clue what that can be. In the end, you may learn that someone is not suited for a task or has not the tools available for the task. And so that also can happen if someone thought he or she can do it without realizing that certain abilities are simply missing. Therefore, it is very important that in the beginning, you try to understand, I'm supposed to do this, I think I can do it, or here I need more help. I, I am not sure that I have the complete understanding of what I think is needed in order to do what you ask me to do. The commander gave every single person of us a specific role during the mission. I was responsible for all the communication equipment and I took three extra simulator lessons purely on communication because I wanted to be dead sure that I understand every switch and why it works, not only if I throw it to on, that then all of a sudden I can hear someone. I wanted to know why can I hear the other person because I throw it on, I don't hear the other person, what else could have gone wrong? So um, it is important that people speak up that when they are given a task that they are confident that they have it what it takes to do it. Yeah and there's a, a great question on trust from one of our viewers I'd love to pose to you. Um, they ask did you have to learn how to be an open honest communicator in the ways you've just expressed or is it a natural skill for you? Well I think I have to uh, bless my parents uh, for this. Um, I, I, I do not know whether I was always uh, like that, but uh, I simply learned uh, during my life that the best way to approach others is to be absolutely open and, uh, and believe that the others are as open as you are. And it doesn't work always, by the way. I have learned um, lessons the hard way too, but um, I am privileged that I simply can put these things aside. Sometimes people tell me, you are stupid, you are doing the same mistake a second time. And uh, I agree, if you do the same mistake the second time, usually you are stupid, but not in this case. <laughs> yeah, and, and that actually leads us to, um, you have a great story about when some pretty serious mistakes were made. And I, I'd like to ask you, can you afford to make big mistakes uh, in a space mission? What happens when they do? And and how do you create that culture to, so that people can afford to to fail well? and move forward? Well, the, the first thing that we need to re recognize is mistakes happen. We are humans and humans can fail. We are not machines, even machines can fail, by the way. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, but the, the point is we need to understand and realize that uh, if something goes wrong, it in almost all cases does not go wrong because someone did something wrong on purpose. Things happen, bad things happen. And the case I often uh, put forward is the EVA, the extravehicular activity by an Italian astronaut, Luca Parmitano, uh, who almost drowned in space. How can you drown in space? This is unbelievable if you, if you think about it, but uh, what happened is his spacesuit leaked water. Uh, we have water running in a coolant loop uh, to keep our bodies uh, cooled. Working in space is, uh, is demanding for the body. You produce a lot of heat and, uh, and this water leaked out and somehow found its way into the helmet and in the end covered his entire face, eyes, nose, uh, ears and eventually also the mouth. And uh, we got him back safely um, just in time. Um, and what we learned there is, we, we learned a lot of lessons, but uh, let me give you just one example. Um, it, 
a bad accident is never happening just because of one failure. It's always a sequence of events. And what we train is to recognize that what we call a chain of errors is going on. And if you interrupt it at one point, nothing bad is going to happen. And during Luca's flight, we, when you are out there, uh, you breathe pure oxygen, but you exhale carbon dioxide. So the result is that in your little uh, space suit, the carbon dioxide level slowly increases. And we have a sensor that warns you if the levels become too high or that you should be careful. And that sensor is sensitive itself to humidity. And as I mentioned, it is a, it is a tedious task. You start sweating. And so the sensor always fails. It's something that happens uh, during every single spacewalk. I, I'm not sure whether it's 100%, but in almost all cases, the sensor fails after five hours, after six hours, sometimes even later. In Luca's case, it failed after 37 minutes. And yeah. so the sensor failed, and they said, oh, the CO2 sensor failed. That's normal. No one asked the question did it ever fail after half an hour into the into the EVA, what is going on here? Mm. And that is one of the things that I mean. Uh, in hindsight, everyone says, how can that happen? But if you are uh, eager to achieve something, uh, you see a signal that you expect to happen anyway, you don't realize that it comes at the wrong time. Mm. It's so and interesting. This is just one example uh, how things can all of a sudden take a wrong turn. Yeah, but um, but how did you all handle that that conflict or, or situation when he did come back and then you were assessing what happened? Um, how did you transition out to learn from that experience? Well, in, in, in this specific experience, NASA did an outstanding job, I must say, especially, uh, I think, Dick, is for Dick Hansen, who was in charge of looking at this. And, and uh, he said, folks, this is a chance to learn something here. And I want everyone to speak up and not to blame someone else, you should have done this and this and this. I, we simply would like to understand what happened. And then we will draw our conclusions from that. And it turned out that there were two young engineers who, uh, who had suggested even before the EVA started that there certain tests should be made, which were turned down because it seemed to be too complicated, too complex. It has implications that no one can really understand, especially you two young guys. Uh, it was not that you don't know what you are talking about, but I do that already since 20 years. I know exactly what it means, so we better don't ask. It's these no, kinds of things that then all of a sudden uh, become visible. And uh, it is a sign of how habits that develop over time, uh, which are often helpful, can sometimes indeed be an obstacle or a real problem. Mm, yeah, so interesting. Um, thanks for sharing that. It's a great story. We have a, a question that is a really good one. Um, how did you manage conflict within the team in such extreme situations and such close quarters? Well, conflict you can only imagine man managing by really speaking about it and openly. Uh, if you know each other well, uh, then you understand if uh, Gerhard says something to Kevin or Kevin says something to Gerhard, it's not meant personally, oh, you are a bad person or this is really stupid what you are doing. Uh, there, there is the understanding that, yes, here I see something that I do not like. And uh, so the, the general attitude in our crew at least was uh, to be receptive to feedback that you get from others 
and uh, that happens uh, everywhere uh, in in every family it happens and it is something that needs to be learned uh, initially we had a a, a very interesting situation. Uh, Mamoru Mori from Japan was uh, in our uh, crew and uh, in Japan there is, if, if, if you are being taught something and you have not understood, you, you don't raise your, haze and, your hand and say, uh, no, I haven't understood what you told me, even if you are asked. Why? Because it is considered to be impolite because you are telling the teacher you are not explaining it properly to me. Mm. So they have other means to communicate that they have not understood it. But this is something that we had to learn. We did not know up front. Yeah. And That's fascinating. But that, that increases your sensitivity to observe others. And then um, uh, we found our ways. Uh, Hey, Mamoru, should I repeat that or uh, something like that when we had the impression that there was a question? And sometimes, uh, most of the times, the answers was, no, 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 I, I, I got it. Thanks for your concern. But sometimes uh, the answer was, yes, it would be interesting to, um, to hear it from a different angle. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's this is what I mean with being attentive and sensitive uh, and it shows even more in space because we are not all from one background. We are from many different backgrounds. Absolutely. That's, yeah, cultural differences in communication and dealing with conflict can be very, very different. So taking the time to, like you said, be sensitive and listen well and learn how to meet someone where they're at is a really incredible leadership and just team member skill. Um, shifting gears to our last topic, which is new perspectives, perpe perspective shift. I'm sure you get asked this question all the time, but <laughs> how did your perspective or your view of life on Earth change when you came back from being able to view the planet from above? Yeah, the, the, this is indeed a question that I am often asked and I hardly answer it the same every single time uh, because I uh, my initial response would be it did not change so much on the but that would mean that it had no impact and that is obviously not true uh, the way I try to understand that myself is the 60 year old is a different person or has a different view of life and uh, living on this planet than the 40 year old and the 40 year old uh, had a different view than the 20 year old and this development is the result of many little events and the space flight is an important one of them but not the only one and not the most important one and to identify later on the space flight is exactly respons responsible for this and this and this attitude or few is a very hard uh, decision to make or a hard judgment to make, a difficult judgment to make. So um, has it changed my way of uh, looking at life? I, I'm sure it has, although it is not so easy to pinpoint it. One thing though, sometimes crosses my mind if I look at um, all the adversities that we unfortunately see here on our planet. I sometimes find myself asking when I read the newspaper, oh, the best thing is you just take the two leaders and put them in the spaceship and send them up there. Uh, and they can only come back once they have solved the issue. And I am very confident that they wouldn't stay up very long. Yeah, of especially if they didn't go through the preparations beforehand, because they'd probably be sick, they'd be hungry, oh. they'd be smelly, and they'd be totally unprepared. So they would force them to solve their problem faster, right? Well, uh, maybe that <laughs> contributes also to this. But if you look down uh, on our planet and you see no boundaries, at least not the boundaries between countries, uh, then you uh, very soon get indeed a different uh, perspective. And 
it was, I think, uh, the, the Saudi prince who flew into space who said, oh, on the first day, everyone pointed out to the country. On the second day, everyone pointed to the home continent. And on the third day, we just pointed down to our Earth. Mm, wow. Yeah, that is a, a, a really huge perspective shift. Um, thank you for sharing that with us. Is there anything that you do differently in your daily habits um, or anything that changed from when you went up to when you came back? Every, any daily habits or things you did in your everyday life that changed? To be quite honest, right now, I can't really think of things that have changed uh, be, because of the of the flight. And if things would have changed, uh, I am afraid there were five people at home who would have noticed this and probably would have said, hey, get normal again. <laughs> yes, seriously. Um, we have a, a, another great question I'd love to include. Um, what were you looking forward to most on getting back to Earth? Uh, that is, a, uh, there were, of course, several things, and it changes uh, now and uh, now and then. Um, what I was looking for the most of, of getting back was to see the, the family again. And, and that, that's where we are, uh, when, where we started from with uh, being isolated and uh, confined. It is, it is a strange situation and you want to see those who you love and you know who love you. You, you want uh, to be with them and give them a hug. Uh, um, that, uh, that was certainly um, one of the predominant uh, wishes. But another one that I had up there, I remember it very well, is uh, we were flying across the Pacific Ocean and the Pacific Ocean is a lot of water. Uh, yeah. When you look out your window, you can look 3000 kilometers in every direction. And normally you should see somewhere land, not over the Pacific Ocean. You just see a blue, beautiful, uh, wow. color and then all of a sudden from the right an island came into uh, your view very small it was it was a picture like you know it only from postcards wow. and i said if i could only beam up my wife uh, so that she can see it with her own eyes and understand why i wanted to do that mm. That's really, really special. Did you miss any food? Well, uh, yes and no. I, I missed uh, now and uh, the food actually, I, I like eating, I like cooking. Well, that's and, good. That's good. And, <laughs> and the food yeah. is, uh, I personally thought was uh, extremely well and good. And at one occasion, I remember it, I had potatoes and a nice piece of with stroganoff, I said, it would be perfect if I could have a glass of red wine with it. Wow. Uh, but, uh, no alcohol in space, of course. So yes. I had to delay that until we were back. That is so interesting. You know, it's it's there's so many of these little details that you don't think about. But yeah, it's like how how do you how do you eat? What is the food like in space? I think people are so fascinated by. Um, but uh, it's nice to know that you had a good meal of potatoes and stroganoff while you're up there. Uh, and last, one of our last questions here. Um, if you could give one piece of advice to people hoping to achieve their goals and dreams, big or small, what would it be? Well, the, the most important thing is that you actually uh, have a dream. Um, I tell uh, the, the, the kids when they ask me, dare to dream and don't give up your dreams so easily. With every dream that we have, we have been given the gifts and the capabilities to make them happen. Now, not always it is sufficient, uh, but one thing is sure, you have to work for it. So, it, it, just dreaming about something, it's not gonna happen. Uh, you have 
to work for it and not only a little most likely and then the luck that is also sometimes needed will hopefully join your your work and you Such a wonderful note to end on. Dr. Gerhard Thiele, thank you so much for sharing your journey with us, all the things that you learned and putting it into such wonderful context for us. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Yeah, and thank all of you so much for watching and for your great questions and participation. I hope that you enjoyed this webinar and want to remind you that if you registered for this, then you will be receiving a recording of this webinar if you'd like to share it afterwards. And of course, invite you to take advantage of the free library at getabstract.com, which is available until May 18th. So with that, wishing you a wonderful rest of your week, wherever you are on planet Earth. Last space pun for you. Um, but uh, thank you very much for joining us. Stay tuned to all of our social channels um, on Facebook, LinkedIn, on Instagram for our next expert webinar. But we're very, very thankful that you have been here and wishing you a wonderful rest of your week. Bye, everyone.